Hello, it's a delight to be here. I'm Elizabeth Robar, and like many of you, I wear multiple hats. I'm a mom with four kids, aged four to 15, all of whom we now home educate. My first two were in school for a few years, with some flexi schooling during that. Difficulties at school led us to pull everyone out and home educate exclusively. We're now in our fourth year of full time home education, all with classical conversations. I personally, along with my family, came to Cambridge for my doctorate. And I now head up an organization, Cambridge Digital Bible Research, that works with graduate students, scholars, and Bible translators. The combination of home educating with classical conversations and working with scholars and graduate students has been more rewarding than I ever anticipated. I did not expect there to be much dialogue between the two, to be honest. They're a bit on opposite sides of the spectrum. But oh, how I was mistaken. More and more, I see a direct correlation between the skills taught in CC and the skills needed for graduate studies. I'm teaching my kids and my graduate students the same skills at the same time. How can that be? The wonderful news is that I'm awed at how much better equipped academically and intellectually my children will be than I ever was. Let me walk you through some of what I've seen. Dorothy Sayers came up with a rubric she called the classical tools of learning, which aligns three phases of learning with three separate phases of childhood development. That is, she focused on the process of learning, arguing that the primary goal of education was to teach children how to learn, which we might today better phrase as how to teach yourself anything. The point wasn't that not everybody can absorb information and ideas around them, but that learning in its fullest sense means tackling a new idea or skill and attaining mastery over it. She thought schools should teach children how to learn new subjects, such as to gain mastery. The process thus begins with knowing nothing about something and ends with mastery over it. She found these tools of learning inherent in the medieval classical approach to education, but they're by no means unique to that. They can be found just as readily in the Bible and no doubt many other sources of ancient wisdom. They're thus classical in the sense of time-tested rather than referring to a particular period in history. The first phase Dorothy Sayers calls grammar, but what she means is that learning which precedes understanding. This is identifying the bite-sized pieces of information that are the building blocks for a subject. For a timeline of the world, it's simply the name of events, of famous people. For historical events, it's the who, what, where, and when of the event. For maths, it's a formula or the multiplication facts. But here's the kicker. The grammar stage refers to learning, as in memorizing these bite-sized pieces of information before any attempt at understanding. Keep with me for a minute and I'll explain. From a pedagogical viewpoint, and I speak mostly from the perspective of learning languages since that's my own field, memorization is required for and enables the deepest learning. Passive knowledge only goes so far, but active knowledge founded on memorization is what you really want. The problem is that seeking to understand while memorizing actually slows down the process of memorization. Here's an example. For those who are skilled in learning multiple languages quickly, they do so by deliberately ignoring grammatical rules at first and simply memorizing as many templates as they can. That is, they don't even attempt to understand why the language works as it is. They just try to memorize as much of the bite-sized information as they can. And they do so for the sake of speed. They can learn more languages more quickly if they order the work by first memorization and only afterward understanding. Now, as parents, I find, and many of my friends have said the same, that I'm always tempted to explain because I feel guilty introducing something to my children without an explanation. Surely it's just wrong that a seven-year-old can recite the laws of thermodynamics 
without understanding anything. And yet, what is wrong with that? Am I confusing the process of learning midstream with the end result? Well, when we first started CC, I had a five-year-old and an 11-year-old trying to memorize the same material. The five-year-old found it much easier because she spent no effort in trying to understand anything. She just needed to be able to pronounce it and repeat it back. And if in song, she'd sing it endlessly. But my 11-year-old struggled because he felt almost a moral imperative to try to understand before deigning to expend effort on the memorizing. He found it very difficult to memorize anything word perfect because he'd often substitute synonyms showing that he was memorizing the meaning first and only afterward the very words. The difficulty, of course, was that he wasn't capable of fully understanding the meaning. So when he tried to put things in his own words, he lost out on some of the richness, on some of the meaning. But my daughter could repeat things word perfect. Well, really a string of sounds. She couldn't even read then. Now, if I were to evaluate my children right then and there, Obviously, the 11-year-old had advanced farther in understanding than the five-year-old, but their education did not stop then because we're not educating our children for their lives as children. We're laying a foundation brick by brick for their lives as adults. And if it is easier and more enjoyable for a young child to memorize, even before the child can use the information, why not let it be enjoyable? They love nonsense as long as it's enjoyable. Why not capitalize on their love of repeating things endlessly by giving them something that will become beneficial later on? Because later on, they'll prefer to discuss and debate, but they can only discuss and debate the material they know. If they have a store of memorized material, they're that much more equipped. So that's my own journey of thought on this matter, because I really struggled at first to grasp why one would spend time memorizing before we could understand. But as good as all of that is, here's the real gem that I've recognized that I want to tell you about today. In memorizing quantities of information, my children have learned this. Some information is worth memorizing. Now, for the youngest ones, that's all they've learned. But the implications are endless. Some information is worth memorizing and some information is not worth memorizing. There's a hierarchy of usefulness that determines what is worth memorizing and what isn't. Think of a few hundred paper clips spread out over a table, representing all the bits of knowledge a graduate student might be facing. Every paper clip is linked to at least one other. The constraints of time, energy, and funding mean that you can only pay close attention to or start to memorize a few paper clips, a few bits of knowledge, which yes, causes daily panic in many. Now, the more attention you spend on any one bit of knowledge, the more you'll gain access to the knowledge attached to it. You begin with a passing familiarity in which you recognize a name, one paper clip. With a little more familiarity, you gain access to everything one step removed, the paper clips directly attached. With a deeper familiarity, you gain access to everything two paper clips removed. With memorization, leading to effortless recall, you gain access to everything three, four, and five steps removed. Do you see how critical it is to choose well which information to spend time on and which information to not spend time on? Choose the right information, and in the least time possible, you'll have access to the most possible information. Choose the wrong information, and you may miss out on critical areas because some information is worth memorizing because it becomes a doorway to more information. Now, our children in CC just count on the curriculum to identify which information they should memorize, which is right for children. You know, from age five, they memorize core elements of history, geography, a timeline of the world, English, science, Latin, and maths. And in so doing, they're developing a habit of memorizing the important information and not worrying about the rest. And they're finding in conversations and their reading that that memory work gives them access 
to a whole world of knowledge. So my children have a timeline of the world memorized, which means that when someone mentions Confucius or Emperor Justinian or the Battle of Tours, my children perk up and they're interested. They're ready to absorb information about these names simply because they've memorized the names themselves. All right, I had never heard of any of them as a child and I'd have tuned out any further discussion on them. But my children now have interest and access. But back to the graduate students. How often do they despair over juggling the overwhelming mass of information? They feel burdened to be conversant with everything, often feeling guilty about passing over some and giving weight to only some. My eight-year-old daughter could not tell you how to identify the core information, but she could tell you already several things. One, it's worth ignoring some because that's what enables you to study what you need to pay attention to. And two, you should memorize that important information until you are able to repeat it back effortlessly. Don't be satisfied with a passing familiarity, memorize. Because with real memorization, you have the beginning of internalization, assimilation, and being able to do something with the information. The time spent on the key information does double duty. It solidifies your grasp of the key information while simultaneously granting you access to more and more related information. And that's a foundation for engagement with the world. All right, the second stage. The next phase, which is in the range of nine to 14 year olds, is often called the logic or dialectic phase. And it focuses on questions. This coincides with when children ask why, 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 why? Sometimes it's in a hundred different ways and sometimes it's in the same way, endlessly repeated. There was a bridge that I used to cross on my bicycle multiple times a day with the children. There was a sign over that said no cycling. So we would always dismount and walk, but most people would still cycle across. No joke. Every time we went over that bridge, one son would ask, why are they cycling over the bridge? He asked that same question every time because he wasn't satisfied with my answer. So he actually had the good sense to keep asking because questions are how we explore and learn about the world. Our job is to teach our kids useful questions that will lead to useful answers. But not only the right questions matter, but also the right order. The answers to questions early on determine which questions are useful later on. For analyzing English grammar, which we do with children aged nine to 11 in CC, there's a very specific sequence of questions like a flowchart that will enable them to fully analyze an English sentence according to its grammar. If they get the questions out of order, they'll be confused between say, a predicate nominative and an object complement. Get the questions in order and every element gets properly identified in turn. My 11 year old is in this phase. He doesn't yet know how to come up with questions on his own, but he knows it's important to ask the questions in the right order. And he trusts that they will be sufficient to provide the necessary answers. He knows that when he's got a verb, Every finite verb needs to be evaluated in terms of person, number, tense, and mood. He knows that when it comes to a pronoun, it needs to be evaluated in terms of person, gender, number, and case. He understands that the right questions lead to the right categories, and together they establish a useful system. So just as there was a hierarchy of bits of information, so too, there's a hierarchy of questions and categories. The right questions lead to the right categories, which lead to the right questions. In order to discuss great thoughts, we need to know what we're talking about. We need a system that can organize our smaller thoughts and enable us to combine them into bigger thoughts. Now again, my 11-year-old son would know, have no idea how to come up with the questions and categories on his own. But he does know that if he's given the right categories and questions, he has a method to tackle any situation. He knows that the right categories and questions are a tool adequate to the task. He has the tools for analytical English grammar and it won't take much for him to transfer them to the rest of life. And the third stage, rhetoric. 
This is the stage in which knowledge, first memorized and then understood through questioning, gets put into use, communicated, whether applied or taught. My eldest, my 15 year old son is in this phase. That little boy who once delighted in endless repetition now has no stomach for it, nor for his siblings who are now endlessly repeating. He's not even content with questions about something. He wants to know the, so what? Now that I've come to understand it, what do I do with it? And here's what my 15 year old is learning. Understanding an idea and doing something with it, communicating it, are separate, distinct processes. Having come to understand an idea is only the beginning. Then comes the process of putting it into use and integrating it with the rest of life. Because if you understand it, but do nothing with it, you're like the person who looked in a mirror, saw something very out of place, but walked away and did nothing. The reason we come to understand something is in order to do something about it, even if that's just further develop our own thinking. In CC, we teach this kind of integration in multiple ways. In fact, as the very name of the program, Classical Conversations, it derives from the idea that we want to draw our children into the great classical conversations of all times, integrating everything in conversation. So really, every class is an opportunity to integrate. But we also use persuasive essays to systematically develop skills in putting knowledge to use in order to pursue truth and beauty. For example, this week I had our last class with the 15 year olds. And for those of you who are new to CC, families meet together once a week. From age 12 on up, the children have six hours of seminars each week together, led by a trained director. This week was my last for this year. Anyway, so the boys read their papers on the science fiction novel Starship Troopers, in which they were comparing the fictional judicial system in the book with a modern judicial system. This led to questions of the role of police action as a deterrent to criminal action. Does it actually deter or does it not? The role of social embarrassment and shame and how it should affect the kinds of punishment we permit. So in the book, flogging is permitted and they thought that that might be too embarrassing. And then we talked about, is that a good thing? Is that necessary? They talked about the likelihood that criminals will or will not reform and what to do with those unlikely to reform. If you can identify people who are unlikely to reform, do we have a moral obligation to do something about it? The boys were able to practice, both in written form as well as in open discussion, how to explore an issue and come to their own conclusions. In all their essays, they're required not only to have extensive proofs, but to identify an audience who should be particularly concerned with their argument and why. This means that for every essay, they have to identify a particular audience for their paper. And over time, they learn to tailor the essays for that audience. All right, the connection to graduate students will be painfully obvious to anyone familiar with that group of people. How many graduate students have struggled valiantly to understand a difficult concept? But having once vanquished the massive data, and devised a theory that brings elegant simplicity, they found her with the inability to communicate it to anyone other than their peers. How many graduate students are able to assess a new audience and modify their communication accordingly? Because the audience matters just as much as the material to be communicated. Now, I love all my graduate students dearly, and I'm not speaking ill of anyone but I'm speaking of their repeated struggles as well as of my own when I was a graduate student. Of course, I recognized there was a hierarchy of information, but I didn't appreciate at all the value of memorization. I thought it was old fashioned and unnecessary for somebody with a quick mind as I prided myself, my loss. And it was years before I realized the full implications of the order in which the theoretical questions were asked. I did get there in the end, but it was painful. And I still struggle with communicating material to different audiences. I speak to children, to teenagers, to scholars, to people in the Bible translation world, to plain old normal people. 
it's hard to recast material so that it's appropriate for each audience. I'm still tempted to think that I have the material well understood, and that's all that counts. Then I sit down to try to write out a talk for a new audience, and I realize I need to rethink everything again. Every new situation calls for a new message, even if using the same old content. So in conclusion, home educating with classical conversations has helped me see the weaknesses in my own education and in that of most of the people with whom I work. We've been trained to see some things, but not others. And some of what we've not been trained to see has hurt us. Ironically, it's been through teaching my own children that I'm truly redeeming my own education. I'm reaching a clarity and simplicity that I did not have before. My own organization claims to take the most worthy results of biblical scholarship refined through the crucible of the scholarly process and make them available and accessible to those in the Bible translation world who are not scholars. This means taking material first written for a scholarly audience and adapting it to a new audience. This is hard. And completely unexpectedly, a key element in enabling me to do it is the classical education I'm receiving alongside my children. It's the education I wish my graduate students had. It's the education I wish I had. But it's also the education I'm receiving now. Thank you.